So as Tori said, my name is Dr. Julian Davis, and I am the principal of Abbey College. And what I'm going to do uh, within the next hour is talk to you about um, how you can get to a very good university, a top university. I'm going to focus on the UK, but actually the things you have to do to get to a top UK university are really the same as getting into a top US university or a top Canadian or even Australian university. But the focus for me is, is the UK because this is where we are and we have many of the world's best universities right here. One of them is outside my window, Cambridge University. Okay, so um, just very quickly to tell you about me, my background, I'm a scientist. So I went to Bath University. I then did my PhD at Kent University on microbiology, working with Cambridge, uh, the Antarctic survey here. So that's my background. So I myself have gone to some of the best universities here. I've worked in education for 23 years. I've worked with international students for 20 of those 23 years. And my job now is really to help international students, such as yourself, to come from your, your high school and to get to you to an amazing UK university. That's, a, that's the job I have now, is, is the transition. How do you go from high school to an amazing university? OK, so I'm going to share now a presentation just so you can also see on the screen what I'm talking about. So hopefully now you can see what um, I've got up on my screen, which is a slide telling you how to enter a top ranked university. Tori, can you just confirm that it's up and it's looking OK? Yes, I can see that and it all looks great. Thank you. Perfect. That's great. Thank you very much, Tori. OK, there we are. How do you get it? Well, I guess the question really is, how do you get in? So you may recognize this beautiful photograph that is taken about one kilometer away from my window. Um, that's the River Cam and Cambridge is named after the River Cam, Cambridge. That's the beautiful River Cam with one of the Cambridge University colleges. That's King's College. It's a very famous photograph. I'm sure you've seen images like this. Cambridge really is this beautiful. It's an amazing place to be. It's very leafy, very green, and it's built around the 30 Cambridge colleges. So when you walk through Cambridge city centre, you have a shop next door to Trinity College. You'll have Clare College next door to a street where there's a market. So you, the, the university is all around here. How do you get in? Well, that's that's the important question, isn't it? How do you win a place? Um, and really, for a, a university like Cambridge or Oxford or the other top world leading universities in the UK. So you might have heard of the London School of Economics, Imperial College, UCL, perhaps University of Manchester, Edinburgh, St Andrews. These are our very high ranked universities. They all look for the same attributes in students. Let me try and point them out to you, make it quite simple and straightforward. I think there are three areas that are quite easy to understand that the universities look for. First one is English. Now that might seem rather obvious to you if you're an international student, particularly if your language at home is not English. And I'm sure that's the case for many of you listening today. So to study at university, you must have if you like an adult level of English, that's one way of thinking about this. So right now, being a child in high school, you're moving as you get older towards being an adult. The level of study at university is adult level. Young adult, of course, you'd be 18 or 19 or 20 years old. The level of English, therefore, must be higher than is required in a school like mine. So in my school, we ask for IELTS, if you've heard of that, around five and a half, moving up to six and a half to seven. Universities at the top ranked end, they like to see IELTS from about 6.5, 7, 7.5. The scale goes up to nine, so nine is fluency. So English is crucial to you. There have been students that we've known of who haven't got in to Cambridge University many years ago, not, not in this school, in one of our sister schools, purely because of English. 
imagine that they had an offer to go to university in Cambridge. They didn't get in because they couldn't meet the English requirement. So please take that very, very seriously. And I would suggest to you, if you're applying, or thinking about a top university, you must have English lessons. Even if you think to yourself, I'll be fine. I'll get IELTS 6.5 if I sit it next week. Well, what about IELTS 7? What about IELTS 7.5? They're very hard to keep moving up the bands, particularly for academic writing. That's very hard, even for native speakers like me, it's very hard to be skilled in academic writing. So please take it very seriously. Some universities like Cambridge and Oxford might say, well, of the four skills in English, speaking, listening, reading, and writing, we need you to have IELTS 7 in all of them. In other words, you can't just be good at speaking and listening and have a lower score for reading and writing. It's gotta be seven in all. That is very hard for a second language learner. So in a school like mine, obviously every child gets English lessons. We have seven different levels of English class, actually, because we know there's no point you sitting in, in, in a class with lower level speakers. You need to be at your level, maybe at the high level for you, where we focus on the writing skills. So that's an easy factor to understand about how to get to a top university but it's one of the hardest things to do to keep pushing to get seven perhaps in IELTS in all of the skills. The next thing again it's very straightforward and kind of obvious you've got to be able to demonstrate that you're academically very strong. You can't hide this you can't get around it you, you have to deliver the academic results. It's easy to understand because we all know what that means. We all do exams. We've all done exams in the past and we've all understood the grading process. In the UK, for an exam like A level, you have letters. A, B, C, D, E. A is the highest, E is the lowest. Some years ago, they introduced an even higher grade. They called it A star. So that's the top grade, which is equivalent to about 90% in your exams. For the top universities, well, there's no surprise about what you'd have to get there, A and A stars in your A levels. So that's easy to understand. And I'm sure you probably knew that would be expected of you. You also need to show a similar grade profile in the exams that you might do before A level when you're a little younger, typically around the age of 16. If there are exams in your country that you've sat the universities will look at those. In the UK and in other countries that use the UK system, it is GCSE or overseas might be IGCSE. The I means international. So universities are gonna look at that. They're gonna be interested. What's your track record? So those are two of my three key things. They're also the most easily understandable. The next one is the difference between a strong student with good English getting in and not getting in. This is it, the strong application. So let's focus on that. So how can you demonstrate to Cambridge University that they should take you? They will be having applications from many schools in, in this country. They have thousands of applications, many more, of course, then they have places. This is true of all of the top ranked universities. It's not true of the low ranked universities. So in the UK, there are over 120 universities here. If you apply to universities ranked 100th, they would accept you in all likelihood because the competition there is, is very, very small. There may be no competition at all for the place. But if you applied for a university ranked number 10, there would be fierce competition. If you ranked, if you applied for one ranked number one, like Cambridge, that's extremely competitive. So how do they choose? Well, they'd look at your English and your academic results. We've done that, that's easy. What are they gonna do now? Well, unlike in uh, some other countries, going into university in the UK is not purely on the first or the, on the middle category. So. We know in some countries, 
it is purely your academic result. If you score 94% on average, this university will take you. If you score 85, that university will take you. That's the situation in, in, in some countries. In the UK, it is only one of those three parts. So that's, that's quite important to understand. It's not just your A-level results. It's because that scenario of Cambridge University, they might have thousands of applicants, all with good English, all with A and A star. That is why they then focus on this, on what you say about yourself when you apply. So this is a key feature, and it's true for all of the strong universities in this country, for the Ivy League universities in America, for the Canadian and the Australian universities. There's this dimension that's very hard because this is about you. It's not about the A-level curriculum. It's not about learning physics, being able to do very well in maths tests. It's not about your English level. It's about your interest. It's your genuine interest in that subject. So again, we're the Cambridge University admissions tutors. We have all of these applications. How do we choose? Let's take the example of engineering. We have many students from Abbey Cambridge who have studied engineering and are studying engineering at Cambridge University right now. It's one of the popular subjects for us. How would you choose the next group of engineering students if you were at Cambridge University? Well, I'll tell you what I would do. I would want to know for all the clever applicants for my course at my university, I'd want to know, do you mean it? Do you actually really want to study engineering here? Because as an engineering professor, let's pretend I love engineering. I could talk to you all day about engineering. In fact, if you come to this university, I will talk to you all day on occasions about engineering. I will meet you on a one-to-one -one basis or one-to-two, and we will have sessions for an hour where we talk about your work on engineering. Are you right for that? Is this the right thing for you? Do you mean it? Are you able to sit with me and another student to talk about it, your progress in engineering? Have you got that? Have you got that curiosity, that drive, that love of engineering? And if you have, show me on your application, show me. So I kind of say, well, from your point of view, prove it. Can you prove it to a university? And this is your objective. You have to be able to write and speak, write on your application, speak in an interview, perhaps. The top universities will interview you, Oxford and Cambridge. Will, will always interview. Medical schools will always interview you. So can you talk like a young adult? What that means is with maturity, looking at the professors in the eye and talking to them on a level with them about your subject. And what are you going to talk about? Well, the passion, the intent, the seriousness you have about engineering, let's say. Okay, let's pause because this is important stuff. This is now my challenge to you. You've got to get this. Maybe you're 16 and you're going to apply to university in a year and a half. How do you get this? How do you become passionate and serious about your subject? Well, one way to think of this is, is there something now that you can talk passionately and seriously about? And I would say, think about maybe a hobby you have. So perhaps you like sport and you play soccer, football, we call it here. And you enjoy playing football and you watch football on the TV. Maybe you watch the British football. You watch UK Premier League, right? They're very famous football teams in this country, Liverpool and Manchester United, Arsenal, Chelsea. You've heard of these names, perhaps. Perhaps you follow uh, the Premier League, let's say. Let's let's talk about the Premier League because I'm aware of that, so I can tell you a little bit about it. You might be able to talk to me and write about your interest in Premier League football. You probably can, if it's your hobby. Or you can talk about a different hobby. Maybe it's music and you're playing the piano. Perhaps you play with your friends. Perhaps you like to swim. Perhaps you read particular kinds of books. Whatever it is you do for interest, you will be able to talk and, and write about that interest. 
because it's genuine and real for you. What you have to do, therefore, is to be able to do that, but not about Premier League football or swimming, but about engineering or whichever university course you'd like to do. So that's the way you need to be thinking. How do I get to become fluent in talking about engineering? Now, my experience of international students and of British students is that when they start their A-levels, they can't do that. That's a very profound thing to say to you. Students, when they start A-level courses, in my experience, even in a school like Abbey, very, very good school, most students can't actually sit down and tell me why they want to be an engineer. Not really. <clears throat> They've got vague ideas. There's something there. It's real. But they haven't thought it through. They haven't really got things to tell me as an adult would tell me. OK, so they can tell me, well, I've always wanted to. It's been a dream of mine. I've always been excited by it. OK. Tell me as an adult, though, what would a young adult tell me? Well, I'll tell you what I would do. I'm going to stop this for a second so you can you can see me on the screen. Hopefully you've got that picture now of me on the screen. What I would say to you is, OK, you're going to apply to university in 12 months time. You've just joined. You're in year 12, Okay, the beginning of an A-level course. And you want to do engineering. There is a world of information of engineering out there. You have no excuse for not finding out about engineering. So when you study your A-levels, you'll be studying maths, probably, maybe further maths and physics. That's a great combination for, for engineering. But you're not going to study A-level engineering. That's extremely unusual to do that. You, you won't be doing that. You'll be doing, if you like, the basics, the, the, the fundamental uh, ideas from which engineering is built on but you won't be studying engineering. So you're in year 12, what are you gonna do? Well, I'll tell you what, why don't you read this book? It's got engineering written on it. It's a beginner's guide. Why don't you read that? That makes sense. It's a book written for people beginning to, know, to learn about engineering. And what you'll find in a book like this is it tells you things like how engineering started. What is the history of engineering, brief history? Um, what the world of engineering is now, how engineers think, the mind of an engineer, how engineers fit in with society. So it's, it's a really good place to start. Rather than keep thinking to yourself, well, I wonder what it's like. I'm going to imagine it's like building bridges and I'd like to do. Well, find out. And once you finish reading that book, why don't you read this book? This book is things that an engineer has learned. So an engineer has written a book to say, there's 101 things that I learned as an engineer. And it's fantastic, you know, that, I've read this book, by the way. Um, I've read all of the series, there's a series on this for architecture, for, for design, all kinds of things. Um, you know, one of the profound things this guy's found about engineering, yeah, look at that, I don't know if you can see that. The heart of engineering isn't calculation, it's problem solving. That's quite a profound thing for an engineer to tell you as a 16 year old in year 12. It's problem solving, wow. And here's another one, I just picked up another one for you. A masonry arch, okay, an arch. So if you're an engineer, you'll know about arches. A masonry arch gets stronger as it does more work. Wow, that's quite interesting. And that's what you should be doing in year 12 and in year 13, is finding things that are quite interesting about your subject maybe making a little diary maybe then you read this book from isaac newton about isaac newton father of if you like modern mathematics uh, and the basis of a lot of our understanding about physics some basic understanding perhaps you're a doctor and you want to be uh, a medical undergraduate you're going to read this book then you're going to read this book then this book that's what we do here and that's what i would suggest you do particularly in your 11, year 12, prepare yourself for when you apply to university and the engineer admissions tutor wants you to blow them away with your love and your seriousness about the subject. 
imagine writing to a medical, um, uh, an engineering school and say, you know, what really interests me is the use of the arch. I read about it and I see it everywhere now. I look at bridges and I go, well, isn't that interesting? The arch was used, well, in Roman times. I, I, I can see now actually still in Rome today, there are arches that were built 2000 years ago. They're still around, they're still a strong structure. That interests me and I found it in this book and I read more about it. And then I discovered that the if you put an arch and another arch and another arch, you make a dome, a dome like you see in churches. Again, a lot of uh, structures from ancient Rome still in place. The world's largest concrete dome is still there. So you could talk about that. So hopefully now that gives you what I think is the secret to this, which is read, find things out. You have no excuse because these books, you can, you can get hold of these books very easily. Certainly in, in this country from online shopping, you can buy it from Amazon and get it delivered the next day. You could go to my physics department and they will lend you this book. You can go to the science departments. They've got many of these on the shelf. You can borrow them. So there really isn't an excuse to be not informed and to not chase your motivation with, with, with understanding. There's also, of course, the internet. There's amazing amounts of information from all over the world on the internet. There's videos on YouTube. Information is there. You need to start finding, start accumulating. There's something powerful about books because you're absorbed in somebody's narrative. You get a much deeper understanding when you read, for example, the, um, the memoirs of a neurosurgeon, if you, uh, if you want to be a doctor, for example. Okay, so that's how you do it. I'm gonna put the screen back up so you can, you can see it again. Hopefully that's now back up. Can you prove it? I'm going to tell you how we do it here, because another thing that I think um, I, I understood about helping international students many years ago, not only the idea that you have to read, become informed about your subject. What I also realized is it's very hard when you're 16 or 17 or 18 just to go and do that on your own. You know, it, the classic thing in schools is teachers say, go, go away and read a book, go read, the, read, go, go and read the newspaper. It's very hard to do that when you're in a foreign country, because if you read a newspaper, it's baffling. It's difficult to understand because it's all about British news. Well, it's very difficult to, to, to know where to start. Even going to read a book, well, which book? Wh which chapters in which book? So that's what I've realized. So I'm just gonna talk you through what we do here as, as a, uh, a way, if you like, for you to understand a model that a school like ours uses to help students, not just with their English and with their academic studies, but to guide them to coming across information in books like this and to how to use that information. So this is what I'll go through. Just five quick points about Abbey College Cambridge, about what we do and how we respond to this challenge. The first thing um, in my school is the life of the school is supportive of international students. We, we are an international school, it's our expertise. And in this school, we are welcoming to international students. It, it's, this is what our school is built for, literally, the school that I'm sitting in right now, I designed with an architect about six years ago, we built it for international students, this campus, this boarding campus. We have a house structure here, lots of extracurricular activities. So it's a, a friendly, welcoming environment. Why is that important? Because you will feel part of a community. You'll feel settled. You'll feel welcomed. You'll feel at home. Everything is built on that. You, you won't be successful in a school if you don't like the way it is. If you, if you think there's, there's, uh, there's not enough activity outside the classroom, you want to go swimming and there isn't swimming. So I think that's the first thing for, for me to, to let you know. We can't do anything further with students unless they're settled, secure, have friendships, enjoy clubs, and are secure in, in boarding here. So we have a very good boarding facility here. Then of course, the people that work in the school. I'm very proud to say we have extremely good teachers here. Many of them, like me, have PhDs. 
um, which means that their subject knowledge is very, very high, which is important because I've got students that do Olympiads in many different subjects. The teachers need to have a very high level of knowledge to help students to prepare for Olympiads. We have hundreds of students doing maths Olympiads. It's quite extraordinary. Um, the facilities here are fantastic because they're new, designed by us, and English. Remember, at the beginning I was saying there are three things to get to a top university, English results, your application. So we teach everybody English. All teachers are also teachers of English. Class size is a, is a very comfortable 10, lots of individual attention. And as a result of this, as a result of that, that environment where we're looking for international students to succeed, we know we've got to help with your language, we know you're ambitious, the results are really quite extraordinary. So as a, an indication, 83% of the A-level grades A star A is extraordinarily high. Um, it's three or four times the UK average, extraordinary. Okay. So if you like, that's, that's the bedrock of the school, how we make students feel welcome here, how you settle, how you make friends. And by the way, you will make friends with students from different countries. Sometimes people ask me, well, you know, do the students from uh, Russia mix with the students from Myanmar? Do the students from Malaysia mix with the students from Nigeria? Yes. The answer to that is yes. There's an element here where we deliberately make multinational groupings because I, I, I want students from Vietnam to have friends with from students from, from Italy or Mexico. That happens here. Why do I mention that? It's kind of in passing because it's a huge dimension to your life that you will leave a college like Abbey having had a bit of an insight to people from other countries and other cultures. Of course, the language that you will speak together will be English. That's the common language here. So that's another dimension of, of Abbey. So you're happy, you're settled, you're making friends with people from other countries. Your lessons, there's only maybe nine other students in the class with some fantastic teachers, great academic results. But how do we deal with the problem about the information in these books? How do we help you? To, to read them in a guided way so you feel secure about it, you know what is expected of you and when. Well, we invented a course. This is something actually some years ago that um, it, it really it dawned on me very clearly there was a huge gap for international students that I don't think any school was really addressing. And it's that gap of the fact that international students, in my experience, and also the British students, simply didn't know enough about the subject they want at university. So it's a massive gap, which is why I talk about these books, because then I created a course. We call it pre-degree diploma. Sometimes we, we make it the acronym PDD, pre-degree diploma. So that's an Abbey course. Actually, I created this course some years ago based on my experiences of, of helping international students, particularly at that point with medicine. I was doing a lot of work with medicine and I realized the work I was doing with students on medicine in year 12, we should be doing for all students in year 12. So then we opened it up and we do, we, we now do similar work for the engineers, the lawyers, the artists, the business study students, all of the students in the college now. So there we are, it's unique, created by us. And what we do is we actually allocate time on your timetable. So that's the key to this, is not to say to you, you should go away and read this book. Go on, go, go and read this book. We actually say, well, on Thursday at three o'clock for an hour and a half on your timetable, you will go to this laboratory with all the other students in year 12 who want to study medicine, with the 19 other students who want medicine. Or because you've elected for the business course pathway, at three o'clock on a Thursday, you will go to a different room with 10 other students who want business at a top university. Or in that room, it's law. Or over there, it's uh, financial accounting. So we separate students in year 12, not by the subjects they're studying at A-level, but by what they want at university. The teacher in that room will be a specialist in that subject. So we have people such as me, I'm a specialist with medicine. I've got teachers here who genuinely used to be engineers. So they run the engineering pathway. I've got 
I've got more mathematicians than you can shake a stick at. It's a bit of an English expression. I've got 13, 14 full-time maths teachers here, some with PhDs, some have gone to Oxford and Cambridge. So if you want maths or a subject like uh, perhaps actuarial science, statistics, I've got super brains that can help you with, with applicate, apply, applying to those courses. I've also got uh, teachers who we bring in, specialists we bring in. One example, quite interesting, is computer science. Uh, by the way, I would recommend you think about computer science. It is a, a, an industry that's in huge demand in, in this country. Um, people get very, very high wages here for being very good in computing. It's a lot of huge industries, particularly in, in Cambridge, as you can imagine, around the university. However, what's interesting about computing there are very few people who want to teach computing because this is a bit of a secret you can earn a lot more money being an engineer in computing than being a teacher so we tend to find very few people who will become teachers of computing they would rather be in the world and earn my word very high salaries um, it, it, actually working in companies like ARM and Intel and so on. Well, how do we solve this problem? How do I help students who want to study computer science or software design programming at university? Well, we'll teach them the right subjects, maths, further maths, physics. What we then do for the pre-degree diploma for computing, rather than asking a maths teacher to help with somebody who wants computer science, we get somebody from Cambridge. So I have the CEO of a software company who comes in and he runs the course. Brilliant. This is a man who runs his own software company. So he programs at a very high level. He's very successful. And he's actually a pretty good teacher as well. He's very good at explaining these concepts. So this is what we do. We break into our groups and essentially it's a course where the teachers will help you guide your new learning about your course. So the teacher will say, OK, for you, I think you would enjoy this book. Take away, read this book. And in three weeks, I want you to come back and I want you to tell the group about it. I want you to be able to distill that book into a five minute presentation. So in other words, what we're saying is don't just go away and read the book. Go away and read the book and think what it is you have learnt from the book. That's crucial, because if you can distill your learning from this book into a five minute presentation, later when you apply to university, you can take that and put it in your application. Remember the example about the arch? You can say, I was, my mind was so opened up by the concept of the arch, I learnt more about it and I then discovered many arches uh, in a three-dimensional uh, um, uh, positioning form, a dome. So that's a classic example that I've just made up, by the way, about how you would use your background reading to show your thinking has developed because you love engineering. Please take me at Cambridge University. I'm one of you. I think like you. You see, that's what we're doing. So by giving dedicated time with just the engineering students, with a teacher who was an engineer or a software engineer coming in, if you want computing. I've got a teacher who used to be a lawyer. I've got also a lawyer that comes in and works with us. So with those kinds of people, they will be guiding you under this guided time. Okay, we also have another program. This is part of this, this, this uh, pre-degree diploma, which is now we open up evening lectures to the whole school but it will be about the subjects that students study at university. So, for example, we have astronomy club. Um, we have our own telescope and we actually go in our minibus. We go out to the countryside um, where there's no light pollution and we stargaze. So if you are interested in, in physics or in a, in particularly in astronomy, even if you're not applying for that subject at university, you can join in. So it's a bit like extracurricular activity but to do with an academic subject. So there's no tests, there's no curriculum, but it is you actually joining and finding out something perhaps you wouldn't have learned otherwise. So with astronomy, as it happens, 
we we go to my garden i live in the countryside i've got a very large garden I'm very lucky and there's no light pollution so when you do astronomy club you'll actually be able to see the moon for example you can see that's a, a photograph taken by one of our students with his own camera down our telescope we've actually uh, observed the stars in another galaxy imagine that seeing the andromeda galaxy the suns in another galaxy extraordinary so that's an example of a, uh, an activity you can join just to make you think and to show you things you haven't seen before um, but it's enrichment with academic subjects so there's also biology dissections engineering projects lectures we bring doctors in in the evenings on some occasions to speak to our medic students what a great way to learn we bring students from cambridge university maths department to come and tutor our math students that's an extraordinary opportunity so there we are another dimension to this and look here's examples of some of the books that we'd be suggesting to be reading in the uh, in the pre-degree diploma okay so that i think is the, is the secret to it which is why we've built a course dedicated to it. I can't tell you how important this is for you to, to get this deeper understanding so you can talk like a passionate, serious, young adult about your subject. I'll, I'll come to a close in a few minutes just to finish off with what we do as well. We're in Cambridge. Um, out of the window is Cambridge University Press and Cambridge Assessment. The other side of the building is Homerton College, part of Cambridge University. We are surrounded by the people that write the textbooks, the people that write your exams. If you do Cambridge board, the exams are written just across there, just behind me there. <laughs> Cambridge University lecture that way, 10 minute walk. So we've got strong links with the universities. We bring people in. So in the photo there on the top, we have a Cambridge university she's now working in oxford actually admissions tutor there she is tutoring one of our children giving a mock interview the middle photograph that's our students having a visit to the cambridge university engineering department that's not a public visit it's not open to the public it's a working engineering department how is it we can go well because my students are there my, my former students they invite us in and that's the shot below one of our former students coming in to talk to students about his experience. We also have the other top universities, uh, the London universities, LSE, UCL, Imperial, coming into the college to really talk to students and say, why don't you apply to our school? We've heard your students are amazing here. Okay. Many of our teachers, you can see them there. There's the telescope, look. Um, they've been to Oxford and Cambridge themselves. That helps. Um, we give a lot of one-to-one -one help. So when you apply to the university, it's all done one-to-one. -one. We have UCAS specialists. And this is the outcome. This is the number of students going to these top universities. It's uh, every year about one third of the A-level students in Abbey College, Cambridge, go to the top five universities, one third. And about two thirds go to the Russell Group universities. The Russell Group at the bottom there, those are the top 24 UK research universities. So in other words, top world-class universities. So that's the outcome of all this work. You'll enjoy this because you'll be swept up with everybody else from all the other countries in these great lessons, being inspired and taking reading of books seriously and enjoying finding out about the art. What a great thing to find out. You know, it'll stay with you for a long time. The fact that you've got this wonderful insight about how it is in Rome right now, there's a concrete dome built by the Romans 2000 years ago, and it's still standing. What an amazing thing to find out. There we go. Also, students go to world universities. So I mentioned uh, Ivy League, Harvard, for example, or universities uh, in, um, in, in uh, Canada, Australia, in Europe. Of course, we're very close to some of the uh, European countries. So it's very easy to, to, to go across there from here. And then just to, just to finish off, I thought I'd show you the um, picture of our school that's part of the campus so you can see it's a, it's a new building it's now five years old and uh, just so you can see where I am right now so if you see the building with the white and the uh, the multicolored bits on so if you look on the uh, the top level of the white see there's a garden there with the white walls and the little doors see the garden see the door 
on the right hand side, I'm in there. <laughs> That's where I am right now. Hooray. So that is our teaching and boarding uh, facility. So you can see it's pretty, it's uh, fantastic, it's brand new. Um, sports facilities, uh, 12 laboratories. We teach all science in laboratories, um, libraries, common rooms, dining room, boarding. There's a boarding block next door and a boarding block next door. We've got these wonderful facilities. You can see sports hall. Look at the bedroom there. Uh, common room, dining facility. Um, you can see the bottom left, one of our teachers, that's Graham, one of our former engineers, as it happens. Um, you can see the walls are to be written on. So we have white walls, that's how we teach. It's a wonderful way of teaching, as it happens. Um, and then I mentioned the boarding. So that's just to, to, to show you where the students actually live. We have four boarding houses. The first three on the top there form a campus together. So they're all very close. The furthest one is five minutes away. So it's really very convenient. And then about uh, a kilometer away, we have our new boarding house, which is for students who want a bit more independence in year 13, slightly older children. So there's a bit of a journey there for students that want to go off campus for their second or third or fourth year, depending on when they join. Brilliant. OK, so these are the students last year. I found the year before, before this lockdown thing happened, uh, celebrating their graduation. Um, and just so you're aware, in the UK, lockdown is coming to an end. We are coming out of this. 47% of adults have been vaccinated. Uh, case numbers are falling dramatically. Um, by the middle of June, every adult in the UK should have the vaccination, um, which is very, very encouraging. Um, so we think the future is looking uh, very positive in terms of uh, the education and the life in the UK, hopefully for, for all over the world as well. Brilliant. Well, look, thank you very much. I hope that was informative um, and that you've picked up a few little tips. And if you are a student aiming for a top university, you are now thinking to yourself, I feel a bit, I feel a bit uncomfortable because I've got a bit of work to do. Good. That's what you should feel right now. It's a little bit of hmm, maybe maybe I do need to do something more. That's what you should think right now. That's what a top student should be thinking is, yeah, I, maybe I should take a bit more responsibility and, and find out a bit more about what, what is engineering actually like. Yeah, good, go and do that. Brilliant, well, look, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna pass back now to Tori, who's hosting this. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna stop sharing the screen to see if there's anything that students would like to know in addition to this, any questions. Over to you, Tori. Hi, Julie. Thank you very much for that um, very detailed presentation. We have had some questions that have come through during right. the course of the presentation. Um, I'm just going to start off with one that's just come in, actually, about students who possibly want to go to an American university. Yep. Um, is it possible to go to the USA after being at school within the UK? And would we be able to help with things like that and an American application? Yeah, OK, good. So um, I would be very happy for you to apply to an American university. Um, you know, in, in terms of your future, going to an Ivy League, uh, you know, top universities in America or Russell Group universities, they are going to give you tremendous opportunities in the future. You'll be very employable, very attractive to employers in the future. Or, or indeed, if you have your own business in the future, you'll have had a very strong, secure education at a very high level. So go for it. Go for it. The approach that we take here is in year 12, which is the year before the A-level exams, everybody does this preparation course. Everybody's reading these books, doing projects, doing presentations, learning about their course. In year 13, that's when you apply. All of ap the applications are done with you getting one-to-one -one advice with a tutor and then with a director of studies. And then, if necessary, with a vice principal or for certain subjects like medicine, with me. It's one-to-one. -one. Our directors of studies, you saw that list of, of international universities. So I will just briefly put that back up so you can see just in the past where students have gone. So if I spin you back one second, there we are. That's, that's the list of universities for the past five years. So you can see on there, the top left, Harvard, Penn, State, Columbia, Thompson Rivers, those are US universities. How did those students get in? Because our directors of studies 
specialize in university applications anywhere in the world. So they will guide you. They will help you understand the, the, the tests you might have to do. In addition, there are there are some tests from, for many universities that you have to do in addition to A-level. So um, Cambridge University have thinking skills tests. I didn't really talk about that, but that's part of it. There might be a SAT test you have to do. We will look after all of that one to one with you. So you'll be sat down and you'll be counseled and your tutor will say, OK, so engineering, you want to go to US. Have you found out which are the good US schools? Have you looked at a, a, a range from the very, very top, which might be extremely hard to get into, Harvard perhaps, to, to, to slightly lower ranked universities? Let's look at a spectrum to make you the, give you the greatest chance. And that then goes to the director of studies and they will then have meetings with you one-to-one -one as you apply. This actually goes on all year because in the UK, you apply in October for the top universities. For other countries, the applications happen during the year and it's the same for other subjects like medicine you apply to different universities at different times so the directors of studies their job is exactly this all year round to counsel one-to-one -one students who are entering pretty much any university in the world lovely thanks tori that's great thank you very much for that um sticking with the um pre-degree diploma Hmm. If a student is unsure or maybe changes their mind about what they want to do at university, um, can they attend more than one pre-degree diploma on how do we handle that? Yes, yeah, so that's a, that's, a good, that's a good question. And it's surprisingly common that in year 12, a student uh, might say, well, I want to do medicine. They then go to the pre-degree diploma. They, they start reading. They find out, perhaps by reading a book like this, the, a, a doctor telling you what it's actually like in hospital. So you read a couple of chapters and you think, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Forget it. That's not me. Okay, good. Now you know. Now you know, not in a year's time when you're in the hospital hating every minute of it. Now you've got a better idea. And that's part of the point of the pre-degree diploma is to test it out. Well, find out what, what's it like. So I've had students genuinely start a course for medicine and then after some time going actually you know what i i don't think it's medicine for me it might be it might be biology so they go to the biology one and then actually we had a student transferred to the engineering one and went oh it, of course this makes sense now i love engineering yeah i think this is for me so you want to you want to do that in year 12 because there's no consequence of these decisions being changed and of course because it's the same time on your timetable you can move classes very easily and i would encourage you if you do not know to explore the ideas and, and try it out because there's no consequence to changing it it really doesn't matter and this is all about you being comfortable and informed about your decision and making the right decision at the end of your 12. okay that's wonderful thank you very much um, and then another question we had, going back to the beginning of the presentation where we were talking about the English levels required for, for yeah. top universities. Um, and we had a question in terms of, does the IELTS level um, require vary depending on the university course? So for example, our humanities subjects, do they require higher IELTS? Yeah, I, I, you could probably guess the answer. Um, if you were applying for uh, a, a course like history the demands of you are going to be very high because a course like history requires you to read a great deal history requires you to read sources to then make uh, an analysis of sources and make some judgments and then write essays all of that requires high levels of academic reading and writing compare that to a course in mathematics now in mathematics, if you like, the language of mathematics is mathematics, which is its own language. Whichever country you're from, you study the same maths. So you can see the language required to be successful in that course is far lower. It would be great if you had higher language, of course, but you do not need it to gain uh, success in mathematics when compared to a subject like history. I would also include for subjects that require high levels of language you might be surprised subjects like economics can require quite a lot of language because that also involves 
um, analyzing information that's written and writing essays. So it varies a great deal. And that's why I can't tell you, well, it's IELTS 7 for all universities. It isn't. How would you find out? Well, now that you know what you need to do, which is to go away and find out information, how would you find that out? Well, you go on a university's website and you would type in what English is required for economics at Warwick University. And there it is, you find it straight away. So it is there, it changes year by year. So there's no sort of standard. The university departments move up and down depending on their experience of having our students with IELTS, maybe 6.5 or 7 in their departments. Um, but yeah, it, there is not one size fits all, as we say here. It's not standard. Um, subjects like medicine perhaps would be the highest level because as you can imagine if you if your English is poor you can't really help patients in England you have to have a higher level so it's, it tends to be 7.5 for that so it, it varies that's the short answer that's great thank you very much and then one I think this is the final question we've got um, Again, when we're talking about the classes within Abbey College Cambridge, and you said that it's 10 students in a class, and we just got some questions about um, what is the actual range? You know, is it always 10? What's the minimum? Uh, What's the maximum? No, it's not always 10. It's not, it, it does vary. Uh, the minimum is one. If I have one student who wants geography, English literature, we will do that. The maximum is 14, one four. Um, the average is 10. Uh, we find up to 14, we can do the same as is possible in all small classes. So a teacher can understand the progress of 14 children. You can hold that. So, you know, if you mark scripts that students have done, if you mark 14, you can remember 14 different sets of answers in the classroom. When the number gets a little higher, you can't do that. It's really difficult to do it when there's 20, 25 in the class. You can't remember every child's work. And that's part of the the ethos here is the teachers work on individual children. So I mentioned UCAS has done one-to-one, -one, but even in a lesson when you're teaching up to 14 children, you have a very good idea of each of the children and where they are in their learning, where their strengths, where their weaknesses are, because you can cope with that information with 14. And that's why we do it, to give the teachers a very good understanding of specific needs to get all the children up in the classroom. Okay, fantastic. And then just a couple of similar questions that have come through on the channel, all exactly the same as this one, is um, I can tell we've obviously got some people who are attending who have unfortunately been unsuccessful in some of their applications. Is there a route where students could join Abbey College Cambridge for next year? And maybe it's kind of like sort of miss like almost repeat year 13 and help us um, and we can help them reapply. Yeah, we, we all, every year we do see a number of students who have been in other schools and maybe haven't got the university offers they were hoping for. Maybe they haven't got the academic results they were hoping for. So I would suggest you, you work with, uh, and if you have an agent, work with them. If you know one of our representatives in your country or come to us directly, whatever route uh, is the right one for you. And we will look at your case uh, very positively. Um, we firmly believe here that all children have the right for a uh, second chance, um, whatever circumstances there are at, at success. So we will look favorably on the application, but it's all done individually. As I keep mentioning, it's very important that we look at your needs where you are to see if what we offer here is the right thing and if we can help with, with your objective. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. And I just have one last question um, come in here about, um, some teachers think that it's a disadvantage to have mixed ability students, i.e. strong students alongside the weaker students. Um, do we have mixed ability classes or in things like maths are students um, divided? Yeah, okay. This is a, a very, very old debate uh, in this country, certainly. Should you stream or set or should you not? Um, my view is you should have a good teacher who understands where you are in your learning. So if there are 30 children in the class, that's very hard for that teacher, as I mentioned, to understand your need amongst the 29 other students. If there's 10 in the class, if there's a student who's working at A star, 
and you're working at B, that teacher can still help you both. Because what, what skill the teachers do, and I'm fortunate because it's a nice place to work because the students are good, I, I select very good students. I've got uh, very good teachers, rather. I've got very strong teachers that apply to work here. So I've got skilled teachers. So what they do is they will know, okay, so in this classroom, I've got 10 students. I've got those children on A star, those on A, those on B, and that's a D grade student, right? So I know how to pitch my lesson to reach them all. And I know the A star students may well already know this because they can deduce what I'm doing next, or they can pick it up. Well, that's okay, because I've got work for them. I've got a challenge for them. And in fact, what you see on the walls, remember you write on the walls, there are white walls here, you'll see there are extension activities already on the walls. So a teacher can say, okay, so you three A star students, let me see, right, you've got this, brilliant. I want you now to do question on the wall. I wrote that on the wall last week. Do you see it? Still there. I want you to write the answer on the wall. Meanwhile, the A students, you're still working, and I will go and sit next to the D grade student, and I'll I'll make sure that D grade student gets one-to-one -one help so that they can make progress. That's the key to this, having a small number of children, a skilled teacher with an understanding that everybody in that room must make progress. So in, in short, we, we use mixed ability classes, but they're small and everybody makes progress. Even the, the top graders, that's, that's the key thing with the, the A star students, they must still make progress and not be sitting there waiting. So that work is, is on the walls, waiting for them to turn around and, and access. Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. So that covers all of the questions that we've had from today's session. So um, I can thank everybody for um, attending. Um, and I should say that there will be a recording of the presentation available afterwards and um yeah i wish everyone a very pleasant rest of their day thank you very much Joey. good luck everybody thanks for your time thank you, thank you. bye bye